Recently, I made the decision to engage in a long-term project where I will make a video playlist talking about all of Byzantium's emperors. And that means that my focus on being a completionist will cause me to have to talk about a few people who really aren't very interesting. And here is the first of those videos, because I figure, hey, it's a good thing to get some of these out of the way and then move on to things that are more interesting. So I'm going to talk about Constantine the Third, and I'm going to talk about him for the one thing that he's famous for, for being Heraclius's heir apparent. This coin was minted when Constantine the Third was still a child and his father was still alive. You see um, the man and the boy with the crowns. So without any further ado, let's talk about what little there is to talk about regarding Constantine the Third. When Heraclius took power in 610, he was eager to establish a dynasty and not just be a one-off usurper like Phocas. He also saw that one of the problems that Phocas had as emperor was a lack of legitimacy, and that part of that lack of legitimacy stemmed from the fact that Phocas had no male heirs, and that he had to adopt Priscus, who you know, then of course contacted Heraclius' father asking for help. So wanting to avoid a sad middle age, Heraclius and his wife focused heavily on making children. Um, in 612, um, Eudokia gave birth to a son who at the time was mostly called Heraclius Constantine, and this young man would then be crowned in 613 as a co-emperor. Um, we know him as Constantine the Third, and we don't really know anything else about what he did in his life between being born, being crowned, and then his dad's death. But in 641, Heraclius died of exhaustion, and it's possible that Constantine III, during those last few years when his dad was back in the capital, was helping him run the state in some capacity. We don't really know. But he was 29 when his dad died, so about the same age his dad had been when he came to power. However, unlike Heraclius, who was vigorous and active and accomplished, it looks like Constantine had barely left the palace. He didn't have very good health, um, and so far as we know, he hadn't really achieved anything of note. I'm sure he had held a few honorary offices or titles, but he hadn't really done much else besides. Also, I'd like to point out that if you were to type in Constantine III in your browser looking for additional information, you would be very likely to run across the Western Roman Emperor Constantine III, who ruled from 407 to 411, but who was normally considered a usurper so the Byzantine um, historical tradition did not really count him, um, and they considered Heraclius Constantine to be Constantine III. In case you're a little bit interested in the Western Constantine III, this is his coin to the right. In November of 641, Heraclius Novus Constantinus Augustus, or as we like to call him Constantine III, took control as the senior ruler of the Byzantine Empire. He was not, as we'll see later, the sole ruler, but he was the senior ruler. And the first problem he faced is that his father left no money behind. Um, the empire was broke. They had been fighting the Persians and then the Arabs for many years, so there really wasn't much to work with financially. And supposedly things were so bad that there's an apocryphal story that Constantine actually opened up his father's coffin and removed his crown, so that way he would have just a little bit of money. Um, and I, I find that comparable to a story I heard on Horrible Histories, where um, George IV dug up a lot of his ancestors and was curious what they looked like. Um, anyway, I had to make this interesting and stretch it out a little bit. That's why I'm talking about George IV at random. Okay, so back back to uh, Constantine the Third, and of course he obviously inherited some great foreign challenges, and he wasn't really able to face them because he only lived until May. One other fact about Constantine the Third is that he lost his mother at a young age, and that Heraclius remarried um, his niece named Martina, and had a whole slew of other children. So. Constantine III was not the only potential heir, and because Heraclius was worried about the fate of the children he had by Martina, 
he made um, Heraclius's half brother Heraclonus co emperor starting in the year. 638. The coin to the right shows that there are three emperors um, on the coin. Two of them are supposed to be subordinates and they all look like grown men. However, Heraclonus at the time of that coin was maybe 11 or 12 since he was 15 at the time that um, their father died. Now, um, it was sort of understood both by Heraclius and by Martina and presumably also by Constantine III that Heraclonus was really more of a stand-in for Martina, who was a very politically active empress, and that if there was going to be a rivalry for power and influence, it was going to be between the senior emperor Constantine III and the former empress Martina. However, it's also worth noting that we have no actual evidence that there was a real rivalry in place between Constantine III and then Martina and Heraclonus. We have no real proof of that. Um, keep in mind that what ends up happening is that the son of Constantine III will go on to be emperor, and he will pass the throne to his son and grandson, and they will have their own view of what happened, and it will not necessarily be one favorable to the Martina branch of the Heraclean line. In May 641, after a long and glorious three months on the throne, Constantine III dropped dead without any warning. And most likely he died because of tuberculosis. It could have been because of poison, but it actually isn't all that likely. Now, regardless of how and why he died, suspicion for his death immediately fell upon Martina and Heraclonus, who were already mistrusted since the public saw Heraclius and Martina's relationship as having been incestuous, and therefore Heraclonus was more or less illegitimate in the eyes of many people. So a prominent general named Valentinus immediately demanded that the young Constans II be crowned to replace his father Constantine III. And then in September, there were rumors circulating that Martina was planning to eliminate Constans II to make way for Heraclonus, and she was also looking to crown one of her younger sons by Heraclius named either David or Constantine, or David or uh, Tiberius, excuse me. And because of those rumors, uh, the crowd stormed the palace, and they removed both Heraclonus and Martina, and then forced them to be mutilated and live in exile. And that is what ultimately secured Constans II and his path towards remaining ruler. So this is what ensured that the bloodline of Constantine III continued and lived on. Because after three months on the throne, you have a great legacy that has to be lived up to. So let's keep it real here. The main significance of Constantine III is that he was the son of Heraclius and the father of Constans II. In his own right, he really doesn't matter. Um, I guess you could make the argument that he did manage to transmit legitimacy. Obviously, there were people who were loyal to his memory and his branch of the family that almost certainly had more to do with his father than with him but maybe he had a bigger political role than is remembered. Maybe before he became ill, he had had a more active and interesting life. Certainly we know that Constans II was 11 by the time that his father died, so maybe that implies that, um, you know, in his late teens, or early 20s, Constantine III was a much more active and imposing figure, and that he impressed people and did things and made political allies and all kinds of other stuff. However, we really don't know because we have almost no information about him. Um, we do know that um, his grandson, Constantine IV, pictured on the right in his coin, successfully defended Constantinople against an Arab siege, so that's a pretty big deal. And his great-grandson is Justinian II, who's my favorite Byzantine emperor. So I guess he's got all that going for him. And his other legacy is that by dying suddenly, he roused a, he managed to um, arouse a lot of suspicion against his co-emperor Heraclonus and his stepmother Martina, and more or less doomed that branch of the family to obscurity 
and ensured that no one from that branch would ever hold imperial office. Next video, we're going to talk about Heraclonus, and then we'll look at Martina, since she clearly figures very prominently in the history of this age.